Today, I'm joined by romance author Amy Lee, who has been on the show before, but she's back today to talk about her new book, X's and O's. I had the best time chatting with Amy about this book, about what she's working on next, and then we had an amazing conversation about book-to-film adaptations that you obviously need to take a listen to because we have such similar takes on the situation, and it's just like a good, fun time. So without further ado, my conversation with one of my favorite Canadian romance authors, Amy Lee, starts right now. Welcome back, Amy Lee, to the podcast. I am so excited to have you here and welcoming you back to the show. Our first episode last year was, I guess, one of my favorites of the year. So we were saying last year because like it was only a few months ago, but technically this episode comes out in 20. Yeah, like the episode comes out in 2023. The book was 20. So, you know, like it just, it's different, but welcome back. How are you? Fill me in. What's new since the last time we spoke like five months ago? Well, thank you so much for having me back. I think your podcast was one of the my most favorite ones that I was on. Oh, so when you asked me to be on, I was like, yes. Thank you. That means so much to me. You were one of my favorite guests from last year. And obviously, like X's and O's was such a highly anticipated read for me for this year. So I'm so happy you agreed to come back. Oh, thanks. Yes. I mean, the, the past couple months, I guess we spoke probably in May. Yeah. Months? May when Set on You came out. So yeah, it's been a couple of months. I after the book came out, I went on a vacation, a month nice. vacation. So that was nice. I kind of took a break from writing and, and everything <laughs> publishing and went to Italy for a while. Um jealous. It was, so jealous. It was really I got some inspo. It was it was nice. Ugh. And then what else? I, I just kind of focused a little bit. There was a bit of a lull between set on you and then ramp up for X's and O's, mm-hmm. but I had to release the uh, the title and then the cover. So I did that. And it's just been, you know what? I think that releasing a first book, like your debut book, mm-hmm. and then your second book mm-hmm. is so different, at least yeah. in my experience. Because all of the the buildup and the ramp up for the first book just feels so large. Mm-hmm. And then the second book, I mean, it's it's still a big deal, but I keep finding myself forgetting that it's so soon. Like it's yeah. coming out in two, three weeks. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just and, sneaking up on you. Yeah. And if yeah. I think about everything I was doing for book one, yeah. it was like I had like a four month countdown and it just, it felt bigger, even though I would say the book two have a copy finally um, so gorgeous probably my my favorite like I I it's the one of my heart okay for sure Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, set on you came out and I feel like everybody was talking about it. I mean, I had read obviously an early copy and I really loved it, but then once it came out into the world, I just saw so many other creators. And then I saw it on book talk a lot. And my sister's friends were talking about it. My friends were talking about it. Now I go to the bookstore and I see it. I see it in Indigo. Like it's so cool. It's so exciting. What's it been like now for you to have this book out in the world and have so many other people now come like regular people, not necessarily people that are bookstagrammers or creators or in this space, just regular people messaging you being like I read this book I found this book I love it like what's that reception like it's so weird I think with um with when you when you get feedback with the arcs from book people and publishing people Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a safe space because you know that those people are very used to romance they're used to the tropes that they know what they're getting typically when they're reading an arc and when you finally start to get people who are just regular readers the average person walking into indigo barnes and noble Mm -hmm. picking up the book it's just, I think that the reception is very different, especially for, for romance books, because some people aren't used to the steam, right. they're not used to, um, you know, the, I guess the conventions of romance. Yeah. And, but I actually find it a lot more gratifying when those people reach out to me. Yeah, I'm sure. From just like a regular account, you know, somebody's personal account, and they're saying things like, oh my gosh, this book touched me in so many ways, and it made me rethink the way that I think about myself and my body. And it's just messages like that kind of make anything that's sort of negative about publishing really worth it. And they make you feel like so validated in in what you wrote. And and yeah, so it's been, it's been really nice, but I think the, the funny part about real world people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially people in my regular day life reading it, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. It's like, I can't imagine. Are people at work reading it? Like who's reading it that you're like, oh God. Yeah. Yeah. I have a a regular day job with the government Yeah, and, you know, public service government types people, they're, they're not usually, I don't know, the types that read a lot of romance. Yeah. And, and so it's just a totally different subset of people who are like, I read your book. (laughs) 
That's so wild. So what's that like when it's people that you know, I guess, that are reading the book? Like, what is that like an awkward thing? Is it fun? Like, what is that reception like? For me, it's it's awful. I hate it. Oh my God. <laughs> it's funny. Like anyone else, people I don't know in real life, I'm like, yeah. yeah, read my book. Please buy it. And then anyone in real life, I'm like, don't buy it. Don't read it. <laughs> buy it, but don't read it. And don't talk to me about it. Don't tell me if you read it. I just don't want to know. That's so funny. Just, especially, I don't know why, because I know men do read romance, but especially like male coworkers or male yeah. family members, when they yeah. read it, I'm just like, oh God, don't make eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> so I funny know. no well, scene. exactly I was gonna say the bathtub scene but no but like literally it's 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 so funny because it's like the most vulnerable part of you even though it's not you but like you're the one that wrote it so like oh I can't imagine but I'm so happy for you then so far from what I've seen at least from X's and O's like from ARC readers people are loving it I loved it there was so much in there I mean I was messaging you while I was reading it there was so much in there that really resonated with me and I just felt like I could have I could be Tara. I could, I could have helped you write this book. Like there was just so much of what me, I am and like what I love in this story. So for those who have not yet read the book, can you give a little elevator pitch of what X's and O's is about and kind of how it relates to Set on You? Yes. So Set on You is part of, I guess it was the first in a trio, I should say, set around um, three Chinese American influencers, different types of influencers who fall in love, smash the patriarchy, and, and all the fun stuff in between. And so all of them, it's not, I guess it is a series, and it's the same characters. So Crystal's the main character in the first one. Her sister is Tara, and her best friend is Mel. So then Tara and Mel have their subsequent books. And um, you don't need to have read yeah, the first and the second, or you don't have to read them in order, really. But it's, I think, recommended in case you want that backstory, or mm -hmm. you want to not have spoilers as to who they end up with, even though, I mean, it's kind of obvious what the romance yeah. <laughs> who they're going to end up with. Um, but all that to say, um, so X is a nose focuses on Tara Chen, who is Crystal's sister. She is um, a nurse, a NICU nurse by day and night, I guess, because they do shifts. Uh, <laughs> and also a romance book influencer romance obsessed person in general who um is one of those people who falls in love with everyone she meets she's very personable she just loves love has a huge heart she's a hopeless romantic and she becomes very obsessed with her grandmother flo's second chance love story so her grandmother had you know re reunited after her husband's death uh, with a childhood flame and so she becomes very obsessed with this idea that, you know, you can find love with somebody that maybe you've already been with and mm -hmm. wants to have her very own second chance love story trope. And in order to do this, she kind of goes back through all 10 exes, all of whom <laughs> have dumped her. So that's interesting. Yeah. Varying results. And she does this with the um, help of her broody, tattooed fireman roommate Trevor Metcalf, who is the friend of Scott Ritchie in book one. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing with him, though, is that he does not believe in love at all. He is not monogamous. He is pretty much a, a big playboy. And yeah. he's the opposite of Tara. And yeah. Things, flames may or may not erupt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Flames may or may not erupt. No, it's such a good story. And when you first told me about the premise of this book in our last conversation, I was just like, I'm a sucker for a second chance romance. I need to read this because in my head, I was like, oh, one of the relationships that she ends up with is the second chance romance. And yes. even from how you just explained it, obviously that's not the case. She's gonna, she falls in love with her forced proximity, enemies to lovers, friends to lovers, roommate. So yes. I loved the idea of like having a book focused on one trope, but the actual relationship not be that trope. Was that hard to write? Tell me about the decision to do that. Like that's so different. Yeah. I, you know what? I knew that I wanted to do something I, I've always loved second chance romance. Same. That has it's one of my favorite tropes. I think just the idea of, you know, there's still hope maybe out there with somebody that you used to love. Yeah. Um, it, it's just always really got me. And I find they're always the most emotional romances. Mm -hmm. So when I first was sort of thinking about an idea for another book, I was like, yes, it's gonna be second chance romance. And um I was thinking about all of the exes and just as 
Tara's character kind of developed. Yeah. And we and I sort of realized that, you know, she is really misunderstood by her exes and she's had a lot of um, I guess her reputation kind of damaged by some of her exes. Mm-hmm. I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe it's not the best idea to have one of the exes be you know, her, her, her mental love. Yeah. And I just thought maybe it's just a cool twist. It's like a wannabe second chance. Yeah. Moment. Yeah. I love that. And Tara but, as a character like is so um, like, I, I just really resonated with her on so many different levels, but the fact that you made your main character, a bookstagrammer, like a book romance book content creator, like is so epic. How did that come to you? Like what part of that world was like, this is the type of influencer Tara is going to be. I think because well, I knew that they were all going to be influencers, all of yeah. them, but I wasn't really sure what she would be at this point. I think I had toyed with the idea of like a travel influencer or, yeah. you know, like a foodie or something, but then I'm like, I don't really know much about food. I can't write that authentically. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> when I knew that, I mean, I like food, but Wait. not that much. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so when I knew that she, you know, was going to be the crazy ex-girlfriend. Yeah. Um, I figured, you know, what kind of things would she like? And then I just kept coming back to bookstagram and romance because I mean, that's me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would say it's so funny. Of all of my characters that I write, I mean, I try not to make them me. I, I purposely yeah. don't, but I think she has a lot of my personality, my interests. And mm-hmm. it's just easy, right? Like to to write somebody who just loves anything romance so much that they have to talk about it with the world and they yeah. want to share their love for it and they want other people to to yeah. love and read and experience the things that they like and yeah. so it just it just kind of fit and I because I was a bookstagrammer and bookstagrammer it was just it, very natural yeah it's a, it's such it's so hilarious and I feel like we're gonna as time goes on like see more books of these types of influencers like obviously Crystal is if like a fitness influencer and there's definitely storylines there but I feel like this space is rather new especially in COVID with like book talk really popping off and I feel like yes. this is just like the first of many but I just read that and I was like that's me and there were so many other parts of the book where I was like that's me and I was literally messaging you as I was reading the pop culture references are so immaculate in this book like the bachelor references killed me all of the Disney stuff wrecked me. The Arthur, the DW meme, yeah. I was on the floor. And also I love that because I feel like in our last episode recording, you may have been wearing that DW shirt that your DW I sweatshirt. I so like no, I was I like, I'm, too much. <laughs> I, I need that sweatshirt, by the way. I need it. But I'll send you the link. Yeah, I I need I use, I think you said the last time and I don't know, but anyway, I need that sweatshirt. But yes, like all of those references were so fun. As an author, like is it hard for you to decide like what you're going to put in where and like how to sprinkle it? Or do you like put a ton and then remove like, what's the method to the madness of like fun pop culture niche references? It, I mean, it's really dependent on the author. And okay. I think there's so many schools of thought when it comes to pop culture references, because yeah. a lot of people, a lot of authors and some readers don't like pop culture references at all. It's like a no go because in some people's view, you know, it it can date the book. It can tell you, you know, if you have a reference to Vampire Diaries or something like that, it's like, oh, that's clearly early 2000s. Right. What if someone's trying to read this 30 years down the line? Are they even going to know what that is? Mm. But I think for me, my philosophy on that is, A, the book is about influencers. Influencers are pop culture. That's yeah. what they're promoting pop culture. That's just, it. it and I'm not... I don't see these books as like timeless classics. I'm not, that's not what Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so for me, putting pop culture references is just a way to relate to, to readers. And I personally love reading pop culture references. You can't have too many. I just, I I like them. And you know, a lot (laughs) of people don't, but I think they, they just work with an influencer book. Yeah. And when I'm writing them um, that, yeah, they just come naturally. I just, I'm always thinking about pop culture. So so good. Why? And I think if anything, I actually took a lot of them out because Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I'm I'm going overboard here. I'm not (laughs) like five in one chapter. We must remove at least three. (laughs) Oh my God. That's amazing. I wish, I wish I could have the edit, the unedited version of that book with all the references because I'm exactly like you where I'm like, there's never enough. There's literally never enough. I love that. Oh yeah. I I just, I love it. It's just fun. It's, It's a good way to relate. And especially because 
whenever I'm writing, I'm trying to do it from the point of view of that character. Right. What is that character thinking about? What kind of things does she like? And so for Tara, it's it's rom coms mm-hmm. and you know anything, any I guess sitcom like like Bachelor, Office, mm-hmm. anything with kind of romance element, she's gonna she's gonna like it and she's gonna reference it. I'm obsessed. So good. Now we need to talk about Trevor because I love Trevor and I didn't think I was gonna love anyone more than Scott, but here we are. You know, that's kind of where we, we landed up. The steam level in this book is amazing. Like I, I would say it's pretty on par with set on you. I feel like for whatever reason that it was like a slower burn in this one, which yes. I, I really did not mind. Like I, I will never complain about any type of burn fast, slow, whatever. Like I don't care, but it just like felt perfectly paced. What was it like to get into these characters heads and write like their intimate love story? Yeah. So oh, this was a challenge for this book okay. because I think with the first book, not to spoil it for people who haven't read that one, but it was, it was sort of, they have a heated moment kind of in the beginning. So you know Mm -hmm. that there's a sexual tension that's there already. And then they sort of stop and then pause and it kind of comes back at around Mm -hmm. halfway, 60%, sort of the typical for a romance book. And um, for, for this book though, I think the relationship generally is just so different because they're friends. They start off, well, they start off as strangers, really. They're just random roommates. They've never met. They don't. They assume they're never going to see each other. Mm -hmm. And as they sort of develop this friendship, it doesn't start off sexual, even though she acknowledges like, oh, yeah, he's he's smoking. (laughs) (laughs) But um, she knows that that she can never have him because she she falls in love so fast and she hears him literally hooking up with other girls in yeah. her apartment. Yeah. And I think even that choice of having him actively hooking up with people in in the book on page, mm-hmm. that's that was even kind of a risk because I know that some people who are very diehard romance, they don't want any reference to the characters having been with other people, especially on page. I hate and that. You know, it's like the person, if he's a playboy, you got to show that he's a playboy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I knew that there had to be a lot of time in between for him mm. to to make that emotional jump between I'm just going to sleep with whoever, whenever, all the time to deciding that he's going to get into a relationship with her because right. he knows that she takes relationships so seriously that he can't just hook up with her on a one night stand because if that happens, she's going to become attached and then he's mm-hmm. stuck with it because they live together. It's the best and- when she's like, I'm not going to become attached. I'm, I'm just, I'm not like when she like catches herself, I was laughing out loud. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the pacing had to be different just because of, of who they were and how their, their opposite personalities and their opposite yeah. looks on life. were going to mix. And I remember, I think if I remember correctly, when I looked on my Kindle, when I was editing it, I was like, oh gosh, the steam doesn't actually come until like 70 something percent, like 75 or something late. Okay. And I was like, people are going to kill me. <laughs> was it that far into it? I think it is. I think it may... doesn't feel that far. I think it's because like the most, like the tension is so good. Yeah. It's one of those like, um, like what's it called? Like a pull and push kind of thing. It's like, yeah. it needs to be on both ends. And because you're, it's, because you're getting so much from like the buildup, it ends up working the, the slowness of the burn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I've actually, I've heard that from a lot of people because I have read books before where the burn is just so slow that it actually kind of puts you off because it's like, we're now at 80%. They haven't mm. even kissed. Mm. I'm bored. I want the steam. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, I really, really tried diligently to make sure that there was enough in the beginning yeah, you know, up until the seventy something percent to to <laughs> tide people over until they get you know the full shebang. Yeah, literally. literally. Because, um, <laughs> and I think one of the ways that I was able to do that was um, she had the dream sequence. Yeah, so there's a little bit of like steam in there, uh, and yeah, just a couple of heated moments where you don't necessarily need actual sex in order for it to be sexy. Yeah. yeah. So I think I really I tried to play with that, and I'm. I'm glad for you that it worked. <laughs> yeah, it definitely worked. What did you take away from writing set on you now writing this book in terms of actually writing on page like intimate scenes? Like were there things that you learned? Was it easier this time around? Like tell me about that. No, it doesn't get oh, easier. It doesn't get easier. Okay. <laughs> always, I don't know if I talked to you about this last time, but I think for me, the uh, the love scenes are always, I write them all at once. 
Yeah. Everyone that I know was going to be in there. I write them at once because I've got to like be in the mindset because mm-hmm. it's choreography. It's like yeah. if your hand's here, his hand has to be here. And it doesn't make sense if your body's here. Like you got to really think it through. Yeah. Logically. Like it's, yeah. it's not a sexy experience. <laughs> <in any way. laughs> um, and so I think going from, but the problem with doing different characters and, and writing scenes for the different characters is they're, they're all going to be different the way that mm-hmm. they experience encounter and the way that they're thinking about it and just the the things they're going to do whether they're going to be dirty talking whether yeah. you know it's all yeah. going to be very different and so you really have to throw yourself in the head of those two characters and how how's their experience going to be different from mm-hmm. another character right and so for me the challenge was for, for Trevor I knew he was a playboy. He's had experience. So he's going to know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he's going to definitely be a dirty talker a little bit. And I don't think that Scott was really that way. And Scott yeah. was more And then with Tara, she, her experience and her takeaway from any encounter like that is going to be like the romance, the feelings, the emotion. Yes. And so those are the things that I really tried to amp up with these two characters, which was yeah. different from the, the, the first book. Right. And speaking of being in each of their heads, obviously this book is only from Tara's point of view. Do you have any, like, I don't know, inkling or like wanting to write any part of this book as like a bonus chapter from Trevor's point of view? I know people are just going to be asking you that because they're going to be like, give me more, you know? (laughs) I know people always ask that. And I would love to, I think it would be really fun to, to choose a chapter to write mm-hmm. from his point of view because um and that was actually something that I really struggled with in the beginning was do I write this one in dual just mm-hmm. because Trevor has such uh an evolution in his character as well it's not right just and I think ultimately I had written maybe a couple paragraphs or sentences trying to do it from his point of view but I think I ultimately decided to keep it as her single POV because he I guess the evolution of his feelings is is really a secret to her. She doesn't really realize that yeah. he is changing his, you know, his feelings. Fine. Yeah. And I thought that if the reader is very aware of that, then it kind of takes away some of that surprise for her. Mm-hmm. So that was my reasoning. But I think I would like to challenge myself to do a duel sometime in the near future. We'll see. Love that. Love that. Okay. Well, speaking of things in the near future, obviously Mel's book is next, correct? Yes. So do we have an any... excerpt of it in, in Nexus and O's? In the physical copy? Yeah. Okay. Well, now I have to go. I was reading it on my Kobo and I didn't yeah. see. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, going to so go. It's after the reader's guide. Okay. Well, I'm going to go um read the physical copy now. It's I'm so excited. Reading. I'm so excited now, but so I guess, can you tell me about the catch? I didn't even know that we were like allowed to talk about what it was called. Like I didn't know any of this. So here we go. <laughs> well, it's always funny because the publishers ask you to release the, um, the title and stuff kind of after, but then the excerpts in the book. So people kind of already know what it is. That's what Fine. happened with X's and O's too. Okay, okay. So that's why we released the cover so soon after set on you, because people were posting about it, like screenshotting the, the excerpt. Yeah. So they already knew. So we were like, we Why are we well. waiting? Yeah. Um, so I assume that will probably happen with the catch too. That's but, funny. Um, yes. So that one is Mel, who is Crystal and Tara's really good friend. So she is kind of like a yeah, fashion makeup influencer. And you don't really get a lot of her in books one and two, because I really did want to save the surprise of her character for, for her own book. Okay. And I think for her, she's a little bit of a character that you you see a lot of the the outside the materialistic aspect of her and um she really does have a, a backstory that um is, I think is going to be surprising to some people okay so anyway her book is basically about her feeling like she's kind of failing as an influencer you know she's getting overrun by these gen z tiktokers and <laughs> she's just like you know a millennial on instagram and she really wants to do things to you know boost her image and and get more followers and gain some more traction because her livelihood depends on it mm-hmm. and so she gets uh to her surprise a travel opportunity to promote a resort or a spa in Canada, in I love that. Canada. I was going to ask you if we're ever going to get some sort of Canadian twist. Oh, I love that. You will. That's amazing. Um, so, That's amazing. 
It's a fictional, uh, well, okay, hold on. So the resort spa is in Nova Scotia. Okay. So it's like a, this luxury resort. So she's like, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to promote it. When she gets there, things kind of go awry with her plans. And she winds up finding herself in a town, a small town, fishing village, um, that's sort of, to me, modeled yeah. after Lunenburg. Oh, my God, wait. Not- that's so cute. The catch. Now I get it. Yeah. That's so cute. I love a pun. Um, oh, me too. Yeah. Me too. So basically what happens is, yeah, she finds herself at this B&B and this B&B is owned by a very burly, grumpy, grumpy, grumpy individual uh, who she butt sides with immediately. And it's very, um, I want to say, while you were sleeping, meets oh. the proposal both the Sandra Bullock both amazing movies yes yeah oh yeah they're my favorites and so that's that's kind of the the themes if you want to like attribute a movie to to them. I'm so excited a Canadian grumpy hero like that's what I need yes yeah, he's uh, clad, like he is full outdoors like a lumberjack vibe give me 100 percent. give me <laughs> so when does the catch come out do you have, do are you allowed to share even like a season I think date. it's supposed to be winter 2024. So it actually is a little bit of a, a, a wait. In You're getting a little break. Yes. You're getting a yeah, little break. Because bake. Um, yeah. I think because X's and O's came out pretty quick after set on you. Yeah, we got so, two books in like six months from you, which is yeah. wild. So we well deserve the break, you know, like yeah. for sure. But yeah. so now that this book, I guess, is pretty much off your plate, I would presume. And in, in right, am I right to presume mm-hmm. that? Like no, actually no. So oh. I, you would think, but it's um, it still needs to go through developmental edits. Oh so boy, those okay. are your initial big edits with your editor. So my editor, I think probably sometime in the new year, Jan, Feb, maybe okay. March, will um, do her big edit, give me her her thoughts. This one, um, I can foresee some edits because it was quite long and I couldn't figure out what to cut. So when oh. I sent it to her, I was like, help. help. <laughs> <laughs> Don't help. That's um, amazing. So I, I foresee some edits, not with what the plot, but just, yeah. you know. Trimming the fat a bit. Trimming. Yeah. And then after um, the developmental edits usually comes the, the copy edits and the proofreading okay. and, you know, putting the whole package together. We okay. have to have a cover for it, which I'm excited about. So when did you finish writing it? If you don't mind me asking, is it like relatively recently? No, it was a while ago, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my deadline for it was, um, I think I gave myself really like harsh deadlines just because I wanted with like my full-time job, I was trying yeah. to be really strict and make sure that I had yeah. the time. And so I finished it like a while ago, probably before, before Set On You came out. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then of course, yeah. Now I never want to say it's finished though, because it still needs all of those edits. Fair, fair. But your first pass, at least it was for those intensive purposes. So now that those three books are kind of, two of them are out, the third one is on its way out. Are you starting a new story world? Are you thinking about writing something soon? Like, are you taking a break? Like, what are you doing in terms of new ideas, new story that isn't maybe related to these three so I think it was maybe before slightly before I was working on um, the catch I worked on a bit of a secret project which you guys will hear about I think shortly hopefully it will be announced soon okay Um, and then but that is not in the adult rom-com space so it'll be it'll be separate okay and then um I, I do want to write something new in the uh, adult rom-com space. I don't know what uh, what will be in store, though. I, I yeah. have given it some thought in terms of um, ideas and stuff. So if you have any suggestions, I'm if dying. it's just some tropes I want to play with and settings yeah. and themes. Yeah. Um, so I've, been, I've been playing around with that. I don't really know where it's going to take me. We will see. I'm so excited. I'm obsessed with your voice. I love your books. Like, you just, I feel like, are one, like a very good match for me. Like, I feel like you and I are very on par with our interests and I just find your humor hilarious. I love the steamy scenes. I love the sweet scenes. Like I just find we're a very good like book match. So anything you write, you know, I'll be like the first person in line to scream about it and post about it and read it, of course. But I appreciate it. And it's probably because we're both Canadian. We're similar age. Yeah. Like I feel like we just get each other. It's just in the water here. It's in the tap water here. Maybe. Agreed. (laughs) Degrassi, that's also another connection. I'm still in my deep binge. I'm on season uh, eight now. Okay, of Next Generation? 
of next generation. I have so much more to go. It's just like very consuming, but it's, it's incredible. Like I'm not complaining, oh, but, but it's, it's, amazing. it's just such a, it's such a, like a mission. Like there's just so much to watch, but it's the best yeah. show ever. And it, because I'm rewatching it, it's one of those that I don't need to be like sitting, watching, staring at the screen. Like I could be like cooking eggs and have it on the background and like still know what Spinner and Emma are talking about, you know, exactly. it's, just, it's good exactly. in that sense, but yeah, it's amazing. Do Americans have Degrassi? Okay, so this is how this entire thing happened. I was posting about being Canadian and somebody messaged me being like, I'm watching Degrassi for the first time. And they were from Florida. Oh, And I was like, wow. wait, how? Because I don't even have my Degrassi watching right now. It's a disastrous combination of things. It's um, scanned DVDs. My DVDs, I like put them into my computer and rip them and put them on my computer. So it's a combination yeah. of that, combination of purchased on um, Apple TV and yeah. random YouTube. YouTube has random episodes. That's how I'm watching. It's like a mishmash of things. So I said to this person from Florida, I was like, wait a second, how are you watching? Amazon, I believe. In the States, bought the rights. So it's on Amazon Prime in the States. Oh, All of them, wow. easy to watch. So I'm hoping oh, something I'm happens jealous. here soon because, like, it would make it my life a million times easier if I could watch it on Crave or Amazon Prime or, you know, one, one of those. But okay, for now, I, smash. I don't think I've ever done a rewatch, oh, like, so ever, good. right? I think I just watched it when it came when on. It was DVD. on. That was like me. Yeah, so really? I have the DVD. So I have rewatched random episodes. But it, and let me tell you, it stands the test of time. It really does. Yeah. Like the message yeah, is still the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it was. It was totally ahead of its time. Anyway, it's amazing. It's fabulous. But I'm so excited for your upcoming books. I actually have some ideas that I'd love to like bounce off of you. So I'll slide into your DMs because there's some things that I feel like you could just take from my brain and really execute well, you know? <laughs> Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Are, have you ever thought of writing? Like I thought of it. I thought of it heavily when I first started my bookstagram page because I was reading so much and I was like, I have a million ideas. I could write a fucking great book. Like I read so much that I could write so well. Yeah. And now I've come to realize because a lot of other bookstagrammers have be, like become authors and I'm hearing firsthand from them how like rigorous the writing experience is and then how exhausting the editing is. And I'm just like, I don't know if I have enough to say. Like, I have a few actually decent ideas in my head that I think would make amazing books, but like, I don't think I could write it into a book. I think I could tell you the right. story that I could tell you the elevator pitch and it's going to be holy hell amazing, but then put it the pen to the paper. I don't think it's going to stand up. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a totally different thing to have the idea and then, and then sit down and, and do and write it. all 100,000 like, words. Yeah. yeah. And like flesh out these ideas. Like, it's so different than having a concept. And at the beginning, I don't think I really like made that connection of like the concept is it's great, but that's just like the first little nugget. Like the actual right. writing of it is so hard. Like how do you fill 80,000 words worth of a book? You know, like that's cuckoo to think about. <laughs> it's it, yeah, it's a process. It, yeah. yeah. Well, even I think even if you have the concept, it's like, okay, but how, how does the actual story play out? Yes. And does it make sense? Because that happens to me all the time. When I first started writing, I had just the concept and that was it. I didn't like plan out the skeleton of the actual plot and how it was right. going to unfold. And I always just came to like a, a dead stop because this doesn't work. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. This, I'm just going to have to yeah. throw this out. Ugh. Anyway. Tough. But I think you could do it. One day, if you ever felt the... the no, do you know what I think I could do? No, but do you know what I really think I could do and I could do well and it doesn't exist and I need to make this happen? I think I would be an amazing person for film studios or TV studios to hire as a console, like as on a consultation basis to adapt books into movies and film. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's where my brain goes. Like I read books, like for example, X's and O's. I'm reading your book, loving it. In my head, I'm watching it in a movie form. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the time the translation from book to movie is just like subpar because the people that are adapting it are not fans of the story the way fans who are reading it, you know, like it's just a disconnect. They're not romance fans. Yeah. Yes. So I feel like not Hallmark because those are like you get a kiss in the last 12 seconds and it pans out and you see nothing. I feel like I need like to work for like a big studio and just make a little imprint in that studio of romance books turned movies. Yeah. And I could knock that out of the park. With with steam, with yes. With yes. Yes. That's what they need. Somebody to advocate. Yeah. They need somebody to like advocate for the authors because so many times authors get cut out of adaptations too, which is a whole other problem. Yes. But yes. 
Anyways, oh. that's that's what I think I need to be doing. But you need we'll see. Amy Hallmark or something. <laughs> well, there was a thing for a bit of time. I don't know if it still exists. It was called Passion Flicks. Have you ever heard of it? Yes, I have. Okay, so that was kind of I haven't seen them though. Okay, okay. So I've watched a few. So they made like um a few like Lauren Asher books, I feel. I forget. Like some of those like really steamy authors. They've made a few of those into movies and the thing is it's like the steam part totally is good but they're very low budget so they're a bit like cringy like the scripted adaptation is not so great so it it maybe works phenomenally on the page but then you have the actors legitimately reading from the book and you're like but it's so cringe when you read it like you have to you have Um, to you know so yeah it's just a production allocate a high budget yeah and also it's it's, i think it's hard to get hollywood to buy into that because People are so into, you know, Marvel movie and a big budget. Like but this is the the argument that I always make is like, look at book sales. Who are driving top book sales? Romance readers. Romance books are selling the best. So they yep. will sell the best in forms of film. You just don't make them properly. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and look at the nineties rom coms. They were why so can't we have those again? Blockbuster. I know, but they don't exist anymore. And now I like foam at the mouth for the random one with Noah Centineo that's like subpar, not great. But I'm just like, well, at least we have something, you know? Like, you know, everyone that comes on Netflix, you're just like, yes, finally. Yeah. And then you're like, eh, it doesn't yeah. have the magic of, yeah. of the 90s ones. Yeah, but I have to say, I'm in the middle also of a rewatch of The Summer I Turned Pretty, and that was a fabulously done adaptation. That's just something I will say for till the end of time. That it's was done so well. No, it was done so well, and I I can't figure out why. I think it's because Jenny was like very involved. That has to be yeah. like the the key ingredient. But season two is coming out shortly, right? Because yeah. they like they teased yeah, it. Are you thinking about it? I'm just oh, so I too think, excited. I think it, for me it was not only were the actors really great, and they yeah. were they were unowns, which was nice because you're not like thinking of them as a certain. Yeah, person. they're not typecasted they're yet. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. They're fresh. They're great actors. I think the script was amazing. I think the script was actually better than the, what I remember the books being. Same, same. I was trying to remember the the differences because I read those books like probably like you like growing up, like when they were yeah. kind of coming out. My sister was reading them right before the TV show because she was way too young when the books were coming out. Like she, whatever. So she was like very aware of all the differences and I kind of forgot about them. And I was like, I kind of like that I'm having two separate it's, experiences. It's like a totally fresh experience. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think just yeah, the the filming, like the the set, everything, the just music, the soundtrack. Oh, I was just gonna get there. The soundtrack. Yeah. It's oh, it, one of the best. One no, of the best. it's just how contemporary. Like the, it starts with "Cruel Summer" by Taylor Swift. Like, are you joking? It just like it sets the freaking tone. It's so good. I know. I know. What's what's <sighs> the song? Um, when he comes in at the at the dance. That's the way I loved you. Oh, that's no. one of my favorite. Me too. And it's me like too. so like you forget how much you love that song. Yes. Oh God, it's really so, so crazy. It's the best show. Anyway, I'm so excited for season two. But that's an adaptation that's been done so well, and Agreed. I need more of that. Yep. Yeah. And to all the boys as well. Also amazing. So good. So again, again, I was talking about, but that's like a good Noah Centineo movie. But again, it's just like the the now there's just not there's not enough options. I find. Yeah. I, I need know. more or options. They are they they. They option the same author over and over. And yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, it's a big problem. Go on, but it let's allows. manifest um some Amy Lee uh, adaptations in our future, please. I would love to see Crystal and Mel and Tara on the screen. Oh, yes. I, I can see it as kind of like a, a sex in the city situation. That's what it is. That's the vibe. Oh. Like an HBO Max miniseries. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it needs to be. That that's the that's the little packaging. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for chatting with me. You're like always the most delightful human to chat with. So I'm so happy you came back and I'm wishing you so much success, obviously on this book and then the catch and everything else. And you'll come back when the catch comes out, even if it's in a year, you'll be back. Of course. Of yeah, course. Of Thank course. you so Standard much. I really invite. appreciate it. It's so fun Pleasure. to chat with you. And Pleasure. you were actually my first interview about X's and O's. So I love getting that. my feet wet. I'm so excited. <laughs> first and best. 